My name is John Stephen Piper. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Nutritional Sciences Faculty of Medicine uh, at the University of Toronto and a, a staff physician in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism Department of Medicine at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And I'm delighted to be able to present to you the lifestyle intervention section of our 2016 CCS uh, dyslipidemia guidelines update. These are my disclosures. So first, what I wanted to address is what has remained the same in the guidelines and what has changed. Well, what has remained the same is certainly that uh, lifestyle intervention, so diet, physical activity, and smoking cessation, remain the cornerstone um, of therapy and the first line of management, as illustrated here um, in the algorithm uh, from the 2016 guidelines update. What has changed uh, is really the uh, continued um, extension and expansion of a food and dietary pattern-based approach uh, in terms of the nutrition aspect of the uh, lifestyle intervention uh, section. Um, there's been a paradigm shift in nutrition over the last uh, few years in moving away from uh, nutrient-centric or nutrient-focused um, guidelines and recommendations to more food and dietary pattern-based recommendations. Uh, it is recognized that uh, guidelines and recommendations based on single nutrients uh, miss important interactions between nutrients, between nutrients um, and the foods uh, in which they're contained and between the foods and the dietary patterns in which they're consumed and the dietary patterns and the lifestyle uh, patterns in which those dietary patterns um, are consumed. Um, a focus on uh, food-based and dietary pattern-based approaches takes advantage of these interactions and actually represents the way we actually eat. We eat foods and, and, and within dietary patterns. Well, what does the evidence say uh, with this uh, new approach? Well, we have 10 sets of uh, recommendations uh, which we have uh, issued um, in, this, in this particular guidelines update. The first being uh, smoking cessation, um, the second on a Mediterranean dietary pattern, the third uh, omega-3 supplements uh, where they are not to be used in terms of cardiovascular risk reduction, the avoidance of trans fats, uh, the reduction of saturated fats, and in particular, um, the replacement of saturated fats with polyunsaturated fatty acids, especially those from mixed omega-3 and omega-6 sources, uh, such as uh, those from uh, canola oil um, and uh, soybean oil, for example. Monounsaturated fatty acids, in particular from plant-based sources, such as uh, extra virgin olive oil and other plant sources. And high-quality carbohydrates uh, from low glycemic index carbohydrates and whole grains, uh, in particular. Heart healthy dietary patterns, where we've looked at a range from the uh, Mediterranean diet through to low glycemic index, low glycemic load dietary patterns uh, for cardiovascular risk reduction and dietary patterns for LDL-C uh, or LDL cholesterol lowering uh, from a portfolio dietary pattern through to a low glycemic index, low glycemic load dietary pattern and DASH dietary patterns. Uh, exercise, uh, where the target is greater than or equal to 150 minutes per week, and low-risk lifestyle behaviors, where we uh, look at the combination of uh, these different factors to achieve the greatest uh, risk reduction. The combination of a health maintaining, uh, achieving and maintaining a healthy body weight, the consumption or intake of a healthy diet, uh, regular physical activity, moderate alcohol consumption, and uh, moderate uh, sleep. I wanted to focus on two of these in the short time that I have in highlighting the guidelines. Uh, the first being on heart healthy dietary patterns in relation to cardiovascular risk reduction and the second on dietary patterns for LDL cholesterol lowering. If we look at the first, these represent the dietary patterns where we uh, assess the evidence. Uh, the first thing to state is uh, in moving towards food and dietary pattern based recommendations, uh, it is also recognized that there is no one best dietary approach. There are a number of food and dietary pattern based approaches where we have evidence of advantages and disadvantages. And the idea is to align uh, the values and preferences and treatment goals of the patients with these, uh, this evidence for advantages and disadvantages to choose the diet that the patient is best able to um, adhere to. And that's uh, highlighted in our values and preferences, which I will get to uh, in a moment. So if we look first at the uh, A through J uh, sets of uh, recommendations that we have here for various dietary patterns and food-based approaches, we have only a strong recommendation or high quality evidence and a strong recommendation for the Mediterranean dietary pattern. But then we have conditional recommendations uh, for a number of others, including a portfolio dietary pattern, uh, dietary patterns high in nuts, dietary patterns high in legumes, dietary patterns high in uh, olive oil, in particular extra virgin olive oil, dietary patterns rich in fruit and vegetables, dietary patterns high in total fiber, 
dietary patterns, which are of a low glycemic load or low glycemic index, and vegetarian dietary patterns. Importantly, though, uh, something that needs to be acknowledged and something I stated up front was that adherence is one of the most important determinants for attaining the benefits of any diet. And there are a number of factors which may represent barriers to adherence, such as cost, allergies, intolerance, side effects. Uh, culinary, cultural, and ecological and environmental factors which may go into a patient's uh, decision making in terms of choosing the diet that best fits. But the idea is to work with the patient to identify um, and implement that dietary pattern which best fits with their values and preferences and treatment goals. And it is acknowledged that certainly that this may be beyond the, uh, really the time and resources and expertise of some physicians. So uh, a dietary um, a nutritionist in particular, sorry, a registered dietitian should be involved wherever possible. If we look now at the um, guidelines, dietary patterns, food-based and dietary pattern-based approaches to LDL cholesterol lowering, we also have a number of different diets where we review the evidence, where we have advantages and disadvantages we can then use to, to make uh, decisions and help our patients choose the appropriate diet. Where we have high-quality evidence, those I, I've put in bold are for high-quality evidence, for example, for a dietary portfolio or portfolio diet, and the different aspects that make up the portfolio diet, such as uh, dietary patterns high in nuts, soy protein, plant sterols and stanols, and viscous fibers an NSEP step one and step two dietary pattern, uh, and then where we have uh, conditional recommendations, moderate quality evidence for dietary patterns high in pulses, low glycemic index and load and DASH dietary pattern. But again, there must be recognition that individuals um, must uh, choose the dietary pattern that best fits their values and preferences that allow them to achieve the greatest adherence over the long term. But importantly, in the case of LDL cholesterol lowering, there also has to be a recognition that based on the evidence of the, the portfolio dietary pattern, one can um, put a number of different food-based uh, approaches together to attain uh, greater um, cholesterol lowering, such that the 5 to 10% LDL cholesterol lowering that one sees with different foods can be uh, summed or accrued. Well, how do I translate these guidelines into practice? Uh, well, to do that, I've given you a, a sample patient, a patient that we saw in clinic in, in Toronto at St. Michael's Hospital. This is a 74-year-old gentleman with mis mixed dyslipidemia and metabolic syndrome that we saw that was referred for hyperlipidemia with inability to meet targets. He was on maximal dual therapy with atorvastatin 80 milligrams and azetamibe 10 milligrams. Um, in particular, in terms of the re um, review of his diet and lifestyle, he was a high consumer of red meat, high refined starches, low fiber, low fruit and vegetables. Uh, the examination was remarkable for features of the metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure, high waist circumference. And when we looked at his laboratory results, we saw an elevated LDL cholesterol of 6.25 uh, millimoles per liter, which was reduced to 3.18 millimoles per liter on uh, treatment with atorvastatin and zetamibe with an inability to reach the 50% reduction uh, we were hoping for. In terms of our assessment um, and applying the, uh, the, the guidelines um, targets, uh, the question we had is, what do we do with this patient on maximal dual therapy? How can we achieve greater reductions? So we uh, worked with our patient in much the same way that I discussed to identify uh, a diet that best fit with the values and preferences and the treatment goals of the patient. And the one that we came up with was the portfolio dietary pattern, which I've shown to you here, the uh, four main features of, uh, which includes nuts, vegetable protein, viscous fibers, and plant sterols. Um, we worked with our patient to implement this. The starting point was a dietary prescription. All of the patients that come through our clinic will get a dietary prescription much like this, where we're really identifying the concepts as they relate to the diet that then the patient can take back and work with the dietitian to uh, implement. What happened with this patient when we did that? Well, here's the results. Uh, it represents the follow-up. So he was maintained on his uh, dual maximal therapy of atorvastatin 80 and azetamibe 10. And what you can see here is that the reduction went from 6.25 to 3.18 on that dual therapy, but then with the implementation of the portfolio diet, we're able to reduce further to 1.88 and down to 1.4 even uh, to January 2016 with a more recent result of even 1.44 uh, just this past summer. So we've been able to achieve about a 78% reduction or 56% additional lowering beyond maximal therapy to show the advantages of diet as an adjunct uh, to therapy. Well, what are the most important takeaway messages then from uh, the update to the guidelines? Well, lifestyle modification remains the cornerstone of therapy. Dietary guidelines have moved away from nutrient-based recommendations, so a focus on single nutrients like low-fat, low-carb, high-protein to more food and dietary pattern-based recommendations. Comprehensive dietary patterns that accrue the advantages of different foods, example, a Mediterranean diet or a portfolio diet, combined with other low-risk lifestyle behaviors, such as smoking cessation, healthy body weight, regular physical activity, moderate alcohol consumption, moderate sleep, will provide the greatest cardiovascular benefit. 
physicians along with registered dietitians, clinical kinesiologists and social workers, again emphasizing the importance of a multi-professional team approach uh, to implementing lifestyle intervention, um, all where possible, can have an important impact in prescribing lifestyle modification uh, to their patients. So with that, I thank you for your attention.